The reason Jesus had no broken bones is because Jesus is the law and God never broke the law. He beat the law, he bound the law, and he crucified the law, fulfilling it completely. But in his brilliance and mastery, he never actually broke it. Because if God broke his own law, he would be a sinner. And so the law was fulfilled, crucified in its flesh. But not one law, not one bone was ever broken. Exodus 12, the Passover lamb must be eaten inside the house Take none of the meat outside the house. Do not break any of its bones. Psalm 34. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. John chapter 19. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. The bones of Christ are the law of God. And not one law has been broken. This is why sacrifices in the Old Testament had to be blemishless. Because if you brought a lame or blemished animal to the altar, it would infer against the cross that the coming Messiah would have sin or that the law would be broken or imperfectly fulfilled. Now, while Jesus' bones were never broken, ours must be broken. King David says in Psalm 51, Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. The Bible says God was pleased to crush Christ severely, but he never broke a single bone. Here we see that he crushes and breaks our bones. Lamentations 3. Jeremiah says, He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. Not to mention Adam's broken rib. Not to mention Jacob's broken hip after wrestling with Jesus. The reason Moses physically broke the law, smashing the literal tablets of the Ten Commandments, was to show Israel that they had spiritually broken the law. The Old Testament physical is the New Testament spiritual. He physically broke the tablets to show them that they had spiritually broken the law. But this is also because the law could never live on hearts of stone. So God gives us hearts of flesh to write his law on. Your heart is the new tablet of the Ten Commandments. Ezekiel 11, And I will give them one heart, and a new spirit I will put into them. I will remove their heart of stone from their flesh and give them hearts of flesh. Ezekiel 36, And I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Jeremiah 31, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their heart and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Hebrews 8 is a direct quote of Jeremiah 31. This is what your conscience is. Cone science literally means with knowledge. Or have you never noticed that the word science is in conscience? This is not consciousness, it's conscience. It is the law of God written on your heart and mind. Hosea 4, 6 says, My people die for lack of knowledge. The Old Testament might be a story of a people who did not have a conscience, which is why we see the way they're acting with all the atrocities. The law back then was their external conscience. They did not have an internal conscience. They were convicted by the law, which is why God sent prophets, which is why it says in times past, God spoke through the prophets. Now he speaks through the word. The prophets going to cities to tell them to repent was the conscience. Now that's inside of you, so prophets aren't needed at least for the sake of convicting us to repent. I'm not saying that prophecy is not valid today. The prophet Nathaniel acted as an external conscience for King David. King Josiah heard the law read and tore his clothes and repented, but he had to hear the external law as a conscience to be convicted. These verses where it says God will write his law on our hearts and minds, an internal conscience, the law now written on our hearts of flesh, not our hearts of stone, the Bible calls this a new and better covenant, meaning it's distinct from the first covenant. I guess you could call that a dispensation. Dispensationalism is not totally wrong. It's just that you got to be very careful with it because they'll start to say things like Jesus isn't the only way to heaven. Other people in the past were saved apart from Christ, which is total heresy. Everyone since Adam and Eve has been saved by faith in Christ, either faith in Christ coming or faith in Christ that he has come. There is no way to heaven apart from Christ, not even for Old Testament folks. In the Old Testament, they didn't have internal knowledge. They had external knowledge. This is why Romans 3.20 says, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Conscience means with knowledge. And it comes through the law, which is written on your heart as the new tablet of the Ten Commandments. You cannot fulfill the law yourself. If you try, even one, you will be accountable for all of them. And your arrogance in thinking that you fulfilled any of them is the definition of boasting before God.
This is why Ephesians 2 says, lest any man boast. This is why Romans 4 says, lest any man boast. Because no one can boast before God except Christ, because Christ is God. The Bible is literally the epitome of, if you want something done right, go do it yourself. So God himself came down here to resolve the mess. Now, how is Jesus the law? We see this in Daniel 5, where the king speaks and his words become law. And if he breaks his own decree that he spoke into existence, even though they tricked him to do it, he's no longer king. The reason you can trust God's promises is because he is the king. And so whatever he says becomes law. Jesus is the word of God, the law of God, spoken from the mouth of the king. So the word of the king is the law, and Jesus is the word. Ergo, Jesus is the law. This is why Isaac couldn't take back his promise to Jacob after he found out that he deceived him by wearing Esau's clothing. This is why Joshua couldn't take his promise back to the Canaanites after they had worn torn clothing to mistake their identity and tricked him into giving them citizenship into Israel. This is why Samson couldn't take back his promise to give the Philistines 30 garments at the wedding feast once he found out they tricked him. This is why Judah was bound to Tamar after she tricked him into sleeping with her. God will never break his promise because of his integrity. Now, in these stories, they were tricked. God was never deceived, but he allowed himself to be pacified by the crucifixion of the law, meaning the fulfillment of the law, as long as it was never actually broken, which is, again, why Jesus' flesh was destroyed, but his bones were intact. So how do you fulfill the law? Romans 13, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another for whoever loves the other has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. The law, the commandments are all fulfilled in one word, love. Is that referring to your perfect love for your neighbor? Loving your neighbor is actually the law that was fulfilled already, and it was fulfilled by Jesus. John 15, greater love hath no man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. Jesus now considers us friends. He died for us. And Romans 5 takes it even further. For if, while we were yet God's enemies, not his friends, his enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, Jesus Christ, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? The greatest love is someone who's died for their friends. And then Jesus goes even above that and dies for his enemies. We live because Christ lives. Not just because he died, but because he was resurrected. So are you saved by perfectly loving your neighbor? No, Christ perfectly loved us. You are saved by his grace through faith in his sacrifice. And if the Old Testament law of love your neighbor as yourself and love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength is fulfilled, what is the new command, the new law? John 13 says, a new command I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. This is a higher command than loving your neighbor as yourself. Loving your neighbor as Jesus first loved you is to love your enemies, to lay down your life for them in love, as Christ loved you unto death. Christ is either raising the bar or clarifying that we misunderstood it in the first place, and it was always that high. Just like they said, well, we didn't do it, and he said, you thought it, and therefore you did it. He wasn't necessarily raising the standard. He was clarifying that God's standard is always above your ability to meet it, which is why you need Christ to meet it for you, and you're saved by grace through faith in his sacrifice. In other words, Christ is the law, and he is the light. And God is sitting there looking at Jesus, who's perfect, and us, who's imperfect. And he had the full right to crucify us by the law because the light of the law was shining light on our darkness. We should have been rightly crucified according to the law. But instead of crucifying us by the law, God crucified the law to save us. But the law was never broken and therefore the consequence is that we must be broken. That's the arrangement. And now you understand what Paul means in Romans 7. He says there are two different laws. So this is the principle I have discovered. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. But in my inner being, I delight in God's law. That's Jesus. But I see another law at work in my body, warring against the law of my mind and holding me captive to the law of sin that dwells within me. What a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body of death. 
So Paul's saying despite his body and the law of his body that needs to be broken, his mind is changed to the law of God. That's called repentance, to change your mind away from the law of the flesh into the mind of God. And he's saying that he needs to be rescued from this body of death that holds this other law of the flesh. And what's the solution? Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. So then with my mind I serve the law of God. That's repentance, to change your mind. But with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. And so the flesh has to be broken. Christ is the law of God that remains unbroken. And the law that lives inside of you needs to be crushed and broken. So Christ's bones are never broken because he's the unbroken law. But your own will, your own flesh, your own law, your own way of life, your will be done. That needs to be broken so that God's will can be done. Like Jacob, we must wear the clothing of our older brother so that our father is blind to our identity. For God so loved the world that he crucified the law to save those who were rightly condemned by it. Apart from Christ and Christ crucified, not one could be saved. I'll be teaching a full Bible study on the law next Monday night. Tonight we're going over the simulation part two with Luke from Voice of Reasons. We do advanced Bible studies like this every Monday night at 7.30 p.m. Central Standard Time on my Patreon. Click this link right here. Click on the War Within Uncensored Patreon and pick any package you want. I'll see you tonight.